Father, this morning, once again, as we are in your presence, everything, everything reminds us of your goodness, your faithfulness. We just want to thank you. We just want to worship you, Lord. Because you are so good, so good to us. I come at this time into thy hands. We need you. I need you. I need you you to use this, this tired vessel. And we need you that all of us can hear your voice from earthen vessels. Because the treasure is always you. Your people have come into thy house seeking you. And I pray, Jesus, you will speak to each one of us. Increase, O Lord. Increase in your house. Let empty stone jars be filled. Let water be turned to wine. Let the joy of the Lord overflow in this temple. Only you can do it, Jesus. So we surrender ourselves into thy hands, Spirit of God. Do your work. For in Jesus' name we pray. I may sound a little confused, but God is not confused. So turn with me to Luke, the Gospel according to Luke. It's just out of sheer tiredness, which I am not, I guess, in the kingdom entitled to use as an excuse. Think about our other pastors who have services, eight services today from 6 in the morning till 1 Monday morning. How tired they must be. Luke 18, verses 18 and 19. Strange verse. Now a certain ruler asked him, saying, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? So Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. It's stopping there, okay? Not reading the rest. Very strange question. Not strange question. Good question. Strange answer. Question is, a certain ruler asked him, saying, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? The first response of Jesus is not to that question. It is to a term by which he was addressed. He did not answer the question, how, how does one inherit eternal life? He didn't answer that. First, he answers the term good. He says, why do you call me good? No one is good, but one, that is God. Sounds strange, right? No one is good. No one can be declared good until God declares him good at the end. Good. Jesus is saying here is an assessment of character. An assessment of character are not made by parents or schools or institutions. It's only made by God at the end. There is something else connected with that. Come to the next chapter, 19, and verses 11 to 17. Now as they heard these things, he spoke another parable because he was near Jerusalem. And because they thought the kingdom of God would appear immediately. Therefore he said, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. Who is that? It's Jesus, the nobleman who came to earth to receive a kingdom. So he called ten of his servants, delivered to them ten minors, and said to them, do business till I come. He committed his business into our hands and he went back. But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, we will not have this man to reign over us. So it was that when he returned, having received the kingdom, he commanded these servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. Okay, money is only used here for our example, but basically he is showing the gift of life which he has given us, the gift of salvation and the anointing. What did you do with it? Then came the first saying, Master, your mina has earned ten minas. Just using the currency of that time. <clears throat> he said to him, Well done, good servant. Because you were faithful in a very, in a very little, have authority over ten cities. 
can stop there because this is an illustration connected with the first passage. So he said to him, now think about the end when all of us will stand before God. Now you will see good being qualified. Well done, my good servant. Now why is he called good? Because you were faithful. My good servant, because you were faithful in very little, have authority over ten cities. Now turn with me to the book of Hebrews and chapter 3. Verses 1 to 6. Therefore, holy brethren, Partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and the high priest of our confession, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him who appointed him, as Moses also was faithful in all the house of the Lord. For this one has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who built the house has more honor than the house. For every house is built by someone, but he who built all things is God. And Moses indeed was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which would be spoken afterward. But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house we are, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. Two people are called there as faithful now. Now if you ask Jesus, are you good? He will say, I am good. Why? Because I was faithful. I was faithful to what the Father committed to me till the end. That's the key. We know, we keep saying, we keep praying, we all say this, Lord, when I stand before you, all I want to hear is, well done, a good and faithful servant. Take charge of ten cities, enter into my joy. That's what, ultimately that's the only, only line that will matter. But you need to realize, for the father to say that, he need to acknowledge we were good. And for us to acknowledge we are good. We should have been faithful now. We study so much about faith. And men of faith and women of faith. For years we've been studying. And Hebrews chapter 11 will talk about a whole list of people of faith. Mighty men and women of faith. But don't think all the men and women of faith were faithful. This can be two completely different things. You could be known in heaven and on earth as a mighty man of faith and still considered unfaithful at the end. Samson is called a mighty man of faith in Hebrews 11. Now who will say he was faithful? These are not the same. Faith and faith. Faithfulness. Works of faith and faithfulness are not the same. Usually we would like in our spiritual resume, we look at our mighty exploits of faith and think, God is tickle pink with me. God says, no. That is what I did through you. I'm looking at your faithfulness. Were you faithful? Remember, we are called to be faithful. We are called to be faithful. To be perfect is, God says, be perfect. Being faithful doesn't mean you are perfect. No. The people who are called faithful in the Bible, except for Jesus, none of the others were perfect. So what does faithful in simple terms mean, in simple terms means to follow through with a commitment 
regardless of difficulty, to follow through. Obstacles, trials, tribulations, temptations, none of this will ultimately stop you from finishing what you started. That's being faithful. And faithfulness doesn't come overnight. If you read the book of Galatians, it's also a fruit of the Holy Spirit. But fruit grows over a period of time. Faithfulness is always a result of the choices we make over a period of time. It doesn't come easy, yet it is not so difficult. I wanted to look at two other, one verse actually, it's repeated by Joshua later. Deuteronomy chapter 30 and verse 19. 3 zero. 30 verse 19. Moses says it first and later Joshua to the next generation will repeat it again. I call heaven and earth as witnesses today against you. That I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore choose life that both you and your descendants may live. If God is speaking through Moses and later through Joshua, he says, I call heaven and earth as your witnesses against you. No, no, go back to the other one. You don't want George, this one. I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses you choose. The problem with this is we take it and we look at that term blessing. And we run after it without realizing blessing should be or is a result of choosing life. We don't choose blessing. We choose life. And blessing should be a result of choosing life. Because you can have blessing without choosing life too. Look at verse 20. So that you may love the Lord your God, that you may obey His voice, that you may cling to Him for... What is He? He is your... He is your life. So when God is saying, I set before you life and death, blessing and curses, choose life. What have you asked to choose? Choose Him. He says, choose Him. Choose me. Because I am life. Don't worry about the blessing. Choose me. You choose me. The blessings you need for life will automatically come. Choose me. For I am life. And you need to realize, from the moment we woke up this morning, we have been making choices. And our entire life is played out as a series of choices or results and consequences of choices made in the past. It's a sum total of choices. And you would think, okay, I began my choices only this morning. No, you didn't. Your choices to wake up in the morning was already determined for so many people by the sum total of choices you made in the past. Because if you made a habit of sleeping late all these years, then you woke up late this morning because it's a result of the choices you made in the past. On the other hand, if you had made these choices to wake up early in the past, automatically that choice has become part of your habit, part of your character now. It's very interesting if you look at Abraham and you do a search on him, you will see how many times it is written about the father of faith, it is written early in the morning. Hey, he never realized that was part of his character, early in the morning. Abraham, take your son, your only son, and offer him as a sacrifice. What is written? Early in the morning. Not, no, no, what are you asking? Not today. I'll take it. Don't worry. Afternoon or evening. You have morning sacrifice and evening sacrifice, no? I'll go for the evening one. That's how we choose services. I'll go for the evening service. When it was to offer his son, Abraham chose the morning service. 
early in the morning. You look at Jesus, you will see when he went to the temple to teach, when did he go? Early in the morning. Now, if Jesus were to come to this church early in the morning, you would find it empty. Yes, scripture says, when he was early in the morning, the crowds had already gathered to listen. A series of consistent choices made over time becomes a habit. And habit ultimately becomes a part of your character, whether good or bad. And please remember, faith is a choice, sight is a choice, both are choices. And remember, no choices are made in vacuum. Behind every choice there is information. And that information is either true, according to God's word, or a lie, according to God's word. But you make a choice based on information. And the problem is, with humanity, let's leave humanity out. We'll use only the church within the humanity. When it comes to spending our money and buying a product, we are very good to go for every relevant information. We won't buy. We won't put our money in until we have searched everything and see which model, where, discount, every factor we'll consider. But when it comes to choosing life, life, when it comes to choosing life, the information manual that is given, we minor on it. We don't major on it. We minor on it. We don't make informed choices of life based on this. Jesus said, my words are life. Scripture says, all scripture is breathed by the Holy Spirit. Meaning, the life of God has been breathed into this. It is there. It's not meaning that if you keep it under your pillow, life will flow into your head. No. That's why God says the word that can save you is very near you. Meaning, it's only three inches. Most people carry the Bible like this. Between the Bible and the heart, there is only three inches. But that three inches takes a lifetime. For most people, it doesn't travel three inches. But God says, how do you make your choices? How do you make your choices? Do you make your choices? Do you make informed choices based on God's information? And God is saying, choose me. A reason? Choices have consequences. And what we do not know is, Choices can have eternal consequences. Eternal consequences. And the enemy tries to tell you that it doesn't have eternal consequences. Choice. One simple choice of a man we know very well. Second Samuel chapter 11 verse 1. Simple choice. It happened in the spring of the year at the time when kings go out to battle that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel and they destroyed the people of Ammon and besieged Rabbah but David remained at Jerusalem. Only one verse. We are not looking at the rest. We know enough. One verse. What did he make a choice? He made a choice that day. I am going to stay in Jerusalem. Joab is going to lead the army on my behalf. Just a simple choice. One choice. It looks very simple. But it's not a simple choice because scripture says at a time when kings go out to war, the king stayed at home. At a time when men go to church, you choose to stay at home. And you probably stayed at home and made a choice. And you probably do not know the effects of your choice because our lives are not described in scripture like this in detail. But one day it will be. And we will show the choices we made which brought us down or took us up. One little choice he made. Simple choice of sight and not of faith. And the consequences follow from a simple, simple choice. Because of that choice, that man chose to stay at home. One day a coffin comes to Bethsheba's house. 
It is her husband. He has to be buried. A baby coffin comes to the palace. It's David's baby that has to be buried. He looks one day and sees his daughter, Tamar, is no longer wearing the dress which virgins wear. And her brother, Absalom, kills his stepbrother, Amnon. Absalom rebels against his father. Absalom, David's son, is killed. Bethsheba's grandfather hangs himself. The trail still continues. Solomon kills his brother. The story is unending. You know that, you know the truth? The truth is, the history of Israel, the history of that nation, the history of this world was changed by one man choosing to differently on one day. One man choosing differently one day. If he had gone to war, Solomon wouldn't have been born. Israel would have probably had another king. The history of Israel probably would have been different. David wouldn't have been fallen. It would have been a different king who ruled Israel for the rest of his life. The history of Israel, Judah, everything. They probably wouldn't have been an Israel and a Judah. The whole history, history, story of the world would have been different if that man had decided, I'm not staying at home, I'm going to work. It will be shown on that day how many men and women fell because they decided, I'm not going to work, I'm going to stay home. And that's when they fell. Or how many men and women fell because they decided, I'm not going to stay home, I'm going to work, when they were supposed to stay at home. Simple choices. Like I said, sight is a choice, faith is a choice. The problem is, once you repeat that same choice over and over again, it becomes an evil habit. And with King Saul, he found it impossible to change. The problem is, the choices we make also. Now go to the Joshua portion. And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourself this day whom you will serve. Now, there is a shift here. Something else is mentioned. He says, God comes through Moses and says, I set before you life and death, blessings and curses. You choose. Then he says, choose me, choose life. Now, he comes, Joshua comes, and God speaks to Joshua and says, The choices you make also will decide whom you serve. The choices I make will either determine I end my life serving God or serving other gods. Meaning, behind the choices I make out of sight, outside of God's word, there is a demon waiting. To inflame and satisfy my passions. There is a demon waiting. Those choices. That's how we sin. We sin because we do not make choices by faith. Faith comes from hearing. Hearing the word of God. Romans 14.23 will say, Whatever is not of faith is sin. Meaning, whatever is not faith, there is a God waiting whom we are serving. We may think we are serving ourselves. God says, no, you are not. You either serve me or you serve the powers of darkness. So choose this day whom you will serve. Choose this day whom you will serve. God says, you choose whom you will serve. That is why Jesus is coming and telling this young man, why do you call me good? I haven't been judged yet. I haven't been found faithful yet. I'll be found faithful when I finish. And how I finish will show how I finished my race. You all this, who are you to call me good? You don't know anything about me. And even if you know anything about me, how do you know I will not slip away from my faith tomorrow? Because everything in the Bible is connected with finishing the race, not starting. 
So God says in Hebrews 3, the portion we looked at, that faithfulness comes from choosing to make the right choice over and over and over and over again in spite of the pain involved. 3 verse 1. <clears throat> no, okay. Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider. If you want to learn something about faithfulness, how to finish your race, he says, consider. Consider the apostle and the high priest of our confession, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him, who appointed him as Moses also was faithful in all his house. Two things are mentioned. One, about Jesus, faithful to the Father, Moses, faithful to God. But what's the difference between the two? <clears throat> One has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, in as much as he who built the house has more honor than the house. For every house is built by someone, but he who built all things is God. Moses indeed was faithful in all his house as a servant, but Christ as a son. That's why we are told, consider Jesus. Don't consider Moses. Learn from Moses, but consider Jesus. Why? Because you, the writer of Hebrews is saying, it's not just a servant, you are a son. You are not just a servant. You are a son. The faithfulness that is demanded from you is more than that was demanded from Moses. Because Moses was a servant, but you are a son. You are a son. And God says, the temptation to quit will always come. Because faith, being faithful is not an easy thing. It's a very difficult thing to remain faithful to God. As a servant, if I call myself as a servant, all I need to do is be faithful to those who appoint me. That's what happens in so many churches where the pastor is appointed by a committee. The pastor has to be just faithful to the committee. He can continue there all his life. But then the pastor is only a servant. But if the pastor is a son... Then pastor knows he received his calling from God. And you know in Ephesians 4, pastoral calling is only from Jesus. Man cannot give it. God has to call him. He cannot be appointed. He has to be chosen. Then he has to be faithful as a son. That's true for everybody, even outside of ministry. It's true for everybody. We are called to be faithful as a son in the whole house. So question is, Am I faithful to God? As a son, Jesus had to be faithful to the Father. As a servant, I have to be faithful only to one who appoints me. If you're working in a school, you need to be faithful to your board, your principal. If you're working in a company, you need to be faithful to your immediate boss. But if you're a son, you need to be faithful to the Father. And then God says, that's how ultimately you will be counted worthy to be called good. Because if I am not faithful to God, then my unfaithfulness will start touching every area of my life. The areas where I am faithful, I am only faithful because there is benefit for me in it. Areas where it is not beneficial, I will be unfaithful because I am anyway unfaithful to God. Let's see scripture. Luke chapter 16, verse 10 and 11. I'm putting it in the order in which Jesus puts it. Okay, This is not my order. This is the kind of order I see in scripture. Luke 16, verses 10. <clears throat> He who is faithful in what is least is also faithful also in much. The principle God puts. Now that's not the word, that's not the way the world sees. The world says he who is faithful in much is who is really faithful. God doesn't see it that way. God says he who is faithful in the least, the little, what is not very important, what we consider insignificant. 
who is faithful in the least is faithful also in much. And he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. Then the next words, he goes further. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, suddenly God says, what is least in God's sight? What is least in God's sight? What is highest in the world's sight? What is the highest in this world's sight? What is everybody after? Money. God says, that is the least in my sight. And he suddenly comes and says, but if you have not been faithful in money, who will commit to your trust true riches? Who will commit to your true riches? Are you faithful? God says, in money. That's where it begins. How faithful are you with money? Now again I say the premise always begins with this. We will say, I worked, it is my money. God says, the gold and the silver are mine. So we immediately run into a conflict with God. I say, it is my money. God says, it is my money. Now whose money is it? I say, I worked for it. He says, I gave you the ability to work. So who worked? He says that in the book of Deuteronomy. He says, actually says, I gave you the ability to generate wealth. That's why he says, the gold and the silver are mine. The earth and the fullness belongs to the Lord. It's all his. So God says, it's all mine. And I gave it to you. When I gave it to you, it was not with the intention to judge you or to take it away. It was to bless you with greater things. This is the least. I wanted to test you. It's like our children. When we start, they start writing. We don't go immediately and buy the most expensive Parker pen and Sheffers or whatever, cross or something. It's, why brother are you buying? No, my baby is going to start to write. Do we do that? No, we don't. We begin with a chalk. And these days they don't use that too, but our days we used a chalk. Then you graduated to a pencil. Then you graduated to an ink pen. The ink pen was a very dangerous thing. Because it cost money. You couldn't afford to lose a pen. I know how I struggled when I lost a pen. To get another one was very difficult. You know my father. You have heard enough about my father. To get another one. Not because he couldn't buy another pen, but he would say, you are not a good steward. And pens were expensive those days. That's how we graduated. God says, I want to graduate you to the real riches of the kingdom. And I'm going to start you with the chalk, which is called money. With money. And how you handle money will decide the rest of your walk with God. That's the least. How you handle money. If you handle money well, he says, more money will come in. Because I can trust you with money. But more that money, wisdom will come in. Not knowledge. Wisdom will come in. True riches of heaven will come in. Revelation will come in. Everything pertaining to life, that is him, will come in because I can trust you with this least. Because when we are dealing with money, it is always another man's. Everybody started with another man's money. Nobody started with his own. Even if you were a billionaire, you started with somebody's. Nobody nobody came with their money. They all started with somebody else's. If you were employed with Dell, then you it's somebody else's money which you are working. And God says, you're working there, And that's been started by another man's money. And I'm watching you, how you're dealing with that man's money. That's why every year at the end, the company will bring a record which is called profit loss. Meaning, whatever you did is counted in terms of money. 
The eight hours you promised to put in when you signed, or twelve hours, whatever you signed in, God says, that's money. And I'm looking, how are you dealing with that man's money? Did you bunk work to go for Bible study? Or did you take leave? Meaning, I will suffer loss. I will suffer loss and go for things of God. Not that I will go for the things of God. Let him suffer loss. There's a difference between the two. Because God is testing you. Are you faithful with another man's money? And then you sit there for Bible studies week after week, month after month, year after year. So much knowledge has come in, but it is not working out in your life. God says it will not work out. Why? Because you stole somebody else's money. He says no thief prospers in a Bible study. You are a thief. He says even when you are praying, I am watching you. Are you faithful? Are we faithful with another man's money? God says, are you faithful? Second, coming to basic things about money. God says, part of your money, part of your money, I didn't ask for all your money, though it's all is mine. Part of your money, I said, belongs to me. And God is saying, were you faithful with that part or giving it back to me? Now, let me tell you a solid statement from behind, rather in front of the pulpit. If you are not faithful when you are getting 100 rupees to put that 10 rupees into that bag, you will not be faithful when you get a million. When you are not faithful in your poverty, you will never be faithful in your riches. Because you are always a thief. Know this. A lot of people make excuses for not giving back to God what belongs to God on their poverty. God's case, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't matter whether you are poor or rich. What is another man's is another man's. It belongs to me. Your brother may excuse, okay brother, forget it, but I will not because that's the only doorway by which I can bless you and I will shut that door. There's no other doorway I have kept for you to be blessed. Are you getting the picture? Are you faithful? God says, are you faithful? After money, we shall move to the next one. Because we don't begin with a wife or a husband. We begin with money. After that, when we have enough money, you get a wife or a husband. God says, after you have got money, and you're kind of settled, not rather unsettled, but settled, now I have given you a spouse. If you're married, if I have given you a spouse, God says, are you faithful? In your home. Are you faithful in your home? Can God say, man or woman, I know you were faithful to your husband, you are faithful to your wife. Now there is something about this. You will say, no, pastor, I have never cheated on my wife, I have never cheated on my husband. That's not the point. The point is, outside of God, your priority is your spouse. Do you have a mistress called work in your workplace? Are you married to your work? Are you married to your sports? Men are married to sports. Are you married to something else? It may not, you may not be cheating on your spouse with a person, but you may be cheating on your spouse with something else, which is not a person. And that is the obsession in your life. God says, you're unfaithful. You're unfaithful. 
You are not faithful. You are unfaithful. Because he says, that belong to her. Or that belong to him. He says, if you are unfaithful, that's because you are making a series of choices. Everything is a choice. a series of choices. He says, please don't go by what you are seeing today. If you continue to make this series of choices, ultimately it will come time for harvest. And when the harvest time comes, your house will fall apart. And if it stays together, it is staying together only outwardly. But inside you come, you will see the spiritual walls are all cracked and it is all gone outwardly for public consumption. The house looks okay. But inside you know it is not okay. And it didn't happen overnight. It is because we chose one day at a time to neglect what was important in God's sight. If you're a man or a woman, you chose, I'm going to be in my workplace. I don't want to go back home. I like this. But God said it is not about liking. It's about faithfulness. If you're faithful, you will like it. Because scripture is very clear. Whatever we sow is only what you're going to reap. The harvest is always connected to the seed. You don't sow apples and reap oranges. It doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. Marriages don't break overnight. Marriages break over time. And it is one choice at a time. One choice at a time. Because you chose... You chose. David made one choice. God forgave David. God restored David, but his house fell apart. We may make one choice. As a man or as a woman, we make one choice. And we repent, we come back. But the consequences may continue generations. And if you are big in God's plan, it may continue generation after generation after generation. When Abraham and Sarah had lived in Canaan for 10 years, and Sarah was getting a little uncomfortable about God's promise, she put a choice before Abraham. You've been here around for a long time, I'm not conceiving, what about my Egyptian maid? Abraham should have said, no. Sarah shouldn't have offered that choice. And Abraham should have refused that choice. Both went for it. What do we have? Till today, bloodshed. Because of a choice one man and one woman made. That's what you need to realize. Choices have consequences sometimes much beyond our lifetimes. Much, much beyond our lifetime. That's why God says, make Right choices. See that your information is right. Your information is from life. My word is life. Choices. Three choices we make as believers. Romans 12 verse 5. So we being many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. It's better understood today because we sang that song. But now understand the scripture behind that song. What the scripture says, we are one body. One body. Though we are individually members, but we are individual members of one body. So God asks us, are you faithful to the house? Of God. It begins as a small unit in a family. First God says, are you faithful in your house? Are you a team player or are you an individual in your own home? Are you team players? Let's take Richie as an example here. Richie is a little child, but he can be either an individual or a team player part of his body at home or be an individual member, meaning he can become part of it, 
of doing everything he is required to do in his house for the house, not for himself alone. Recognizing his home is a body and I am part of it and I have to do my part. God is saying, are you there in the house? Are we there, part of that body? Are we faithful to the house of God? Now God is saying, not saying, you be faithful to the house of God only when the house of God is faithful to you. He's not saying, that's not asked. That's why scripture says, why is Moses picked up has the ideal of faithfulness in the house of God because the house of God was against him. All the way. For 40 years the house of God was against him. But he was faithful to the house. Like we looked at yesterday. His brother and his sister. The high priest and the prophetess were against him. His entire leadership was against him. The whole congregation except for two young men were against him. Yet he was faithful to the house. If there was one man in that crowd who could have said, Okay, I quit. I'm going back to Egypt. I got a resume in Egypt. He could have gone back. He had a resume in Egypt. All he had to go back to that Pharaoh, probably who they have grow up together and says, Hey, man, I'm sorry, forgive me. You know my resume. I will serve under you. He says, Go take care of my army. The others couldn't go back without being slaves. But he was faithful to God and he was faithful to the house. And God says, Are we found faithful to the body? From Hebrews 10.25 Hebrews, not Ephesians, Hebrews 10 and verse 25. Not forsaking, this is told to the body, the assembling of ours together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another so much the more as you see the day approaching. Okay, look at it. Scripture is saying, as the day is approaching, the day of the Lord is approaching closer and closer and closer. The struggles, the trials, the temptation we will face is more and more. Gather more often. Fellowship more often. Encourage one another. You see, you need to understand this. You need to learn to stand behind the pulpit. I'm not saying you should preach. Today, on a Sunday... If only five people had come, you will see half the spirit goes out of the preacher. And the spirit goes out of the five who choose to be faithful because when they look around, the rest of the body is missing. And they look and says, where are the others? God is saying, you owe it to the others. Why do you think the prodigal son's father saw him from coming? Saw him coming from the distance because that man and that woman knew one place was empty at a table all those days and years and they missed him. God saying, are you missed in the house of God? Do you go missing? Do you go missing? God says, how frantic are you when your child doesn't come back home? How frantic am I as a father when you don't come home? Don't you, don't you realize as a mother, your, your nature to be frantic was put by me because I was the parent first, not you? Scripture says the whole family on earth receives the name from our father in heaven. That's why you have a family, concept about a family because he is the father. Otherwise there is no family. He says, I am not gathering. Don't you know the day is approaching? Closer and closer it is approaching. Day. Yes, there is pain. Yes, there is struggle. But it is a body. It is a family. And that family comes over and beyond everything else. God, your home, your family. And then, imagine what would have happened if Jesus, after he rose up from the grave and came to the apostles on the day of resurrection and breathed upon them, fear not, peace, breathed upon them, received the Holy Spirit and he ascended to heaven and never came back. What would be our condition? Who was missing? 
Who was absent? Thomas was absent. Do you know that? How many of us were absent in our lives in the house of God when the Lord came visiting? Maybe that day he came just for you and you were in there. Thomas was absent. But if Jesus hadn't come a second time, it would have cost him. Go to the book of Luke. Gospel according to Luke. Chapter 2, verse 25, and verse 26. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this was man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And verse 36. Now there was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was of great age and had lived with her husband seven years from her virginity. And this woman was a widow of about 84 years who did not depart from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. Two people mentioned. In the first account of Jesus, only two people are mentioned there, actually by name. There's something mentioned about these two people. They both were waiting. And because they both were waiting for something, they both were found present when the person whom they were waiting for came. Jesus came into the temple, carried by his mother. But there were only two people who were actually gathering in the temple waiting for him. The others all came, but they did not come for him. So they did not recognize him. But what if Elizabeth had been absent? All those years, she never came. Or she was said to say, ritual, I'll go once in a while. What would we have missed? What would she have missed? Because she was found in the house of God. Are you getting the picture? The things that happen in the house of God. And God says, I wanted you to be there. Because this is my house. By my name. Don't go missing. Because I want you to be found faithful. Thomas was missing in the upper room. 120 were only there on in the upper room on the day of Pentecost. What happened to the others? Because Paul says the Lord appeared to over 500 disciples before he ascended. On the day of Pentecost, only 120 were there. What happened to the other 380 plus? Went missing. God says, you were not faithful to the house. So, you missed something. You missed something. God says, are you faithful with mammon? Are you faithful in your relationship? Are you faithful in your relationship with man, your home, church? You can be, again, let me put this. You can visit any number of churches, but you can be faithful only to one. In a way, a church is a master because you have to serve in the body. So you cannot serve two masters. You can belong only to one church. Though we are all part of the universal church, yet you can belong only to one church. You can never belong to two churches. Because the minute you try to belong to two churches, you will be divided. Your heart will be divided. And God says, you belong into one place and you serve there and you be faithful there. Third, now third, fourth. How faithful are you to the faith? Jude, verse 3. Just before Revelation, the last but one letter. Jude, verse 3, first. 
Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you exhorting you to contend earnestly. For what? For the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. He says, how faithful are you to the faith? Now here is not talking about works of faith. He's not talking about that. By this basically he means the doctrine. How faithful are you to contend for the faith? Every voice that is speaking to you within the body, outside the body is after your faith. It's after your faith. You see, it doesn't matter how pure the water is. All it takes is one drop of something else to fall into this to contaminate it. God says, are you really contending earnestly for your faith? Are you really, really serious about this? Are you faithful about your faith? Do you spend time to see that, Lord, I'm hearing this. I'm hearing that. I'm going to go into this and check it out. And scripture says in the last days you will hear so much with signs and wonders to take you from the true faith. You see William Booth, the the founder, the General William Booth of Salvation Army, he, it's almost prophetic, the words he said about what would happen at the end. He says the chief danger of the last days will be this. A gospel will be preached where there is forgiveness without repentance, salvation without regeneration, and heaven without hell. And you need to realize and read doctrines today of big, big ministries to see that that is exactly what has happened. They talk about forgiveness without repentance. There's no repentance. Repentance is not even preached. It's a bad word. It's a bad word. It's not even preached. It's not even mentioned. And they put across that grace of God covers it all. You don't need to change. Salvation is possible without change. No regeneration is happening. And everybody ultimately will go to heaven. Big ministries have actually changed the doctrines to fit this in. Do you contend for your faith? I'm not saying you shouldn't listen to so many channels on TV. It's your choice. But when you listen, do you go through the word of God with a fine toothed comb to check what they are saying? Do you check what they are saying? Or do you just receive it because you are not contending? It's not about exam. It's about fighting for your faith. God says, Earnestly, you need to fight for your faith. Are you faithful about your faith? Titus 1 and verse 9. Holding fast. Fast means tight. Holding tightly to the faithful word that has been taught. That he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convict those who contradict. Sound doctrine. Doctrine is important. You need to be very sure what you believe in is true. Only genuine faith will take you to heaven. False faith won't. And God says, are you contending for your faith? Is your faith so superficial? So superficial? God says, you are not faithful about your soul. You are not faithful. Or you don't care. And I have this feeling that people actually don't care within the church. If I go to hell, I go to hell. What they don't realize, there is no escape door in hell. Nowhere in scripture says there is a second chance. And it is out. And the reality is, either he comes or I die. One of the two is going to happen. And the second one can happen any moment. 
And Jesus said, the first one also can happen any moment. And God says, how come you are not contending for your faith? How come you are not so concerned? Why is... You know why we are not concerned? It's because our faith has been made dull. We think if I'm not faithful with my money, it's okay. We think if I'm not faithful with my family, it is okay. If I'm not faithful with the house of God, it is okay. If I'm not faithful about the doctrine I believe in, it is okay. So what did we believe in? What did we believe in? Jude, back again to the letter of epistle of Jude, verse 20. But you, be oh, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith. You, beloved, he says, he talks about a whole lot of people who are trying to mess you up. Then he says, you, beloved, this is your responsibility. It's my responsibility to build my faith. Nobody else can build my faith. I can use the tools others give. Building it is my job. Every preacher I choose to listen to, every book I choose to read, outside and above the basic text of the Bible, it is only I who can build my faith. Nobody else can build it for you. It's your faith. Therefore, my beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, Are we building ourselves on our faith? Will we be found faithful? Will we be found, even whether you are young, doesn't matter how old you are, age is irrelevant. Are we really building ourselves on our faith? Because I believe, honestly believe, a day will come. All these things will disappear. Already it has happened in so many countries. This is gone. They have taken it away. When they take this away, what do you have? Your Bible on your mobile phone, that also will be taken away. When that day and if that day comes, how will you survive? Read the lives of those who survived. People like Richard Wumran, 13 years in the underground prison. No Bible, nothing. It was there in his heart. And see in those cells when he was there, how many others came to the Lord. Because in that isolated cell, with others whom he did not know in the other cell, he developed a a language and passed on scripture messages through Knox. And he got people saved. Because the scripture was in his heart, not in a paper. Because he was contending for his faith. Will we survive? We will say, oh, thank God there is no persecution for us. God says, I cannot send because he won't survive. It's mercy. Don't feel proud about it. No, all our churches are getting persecuted. He says, they will survive. I know them. They didn't waste their time. They didn't. None of them wasted their time. God says, what he says, It is not that I will hold it back for all time. It will come to pass for everybody. At that time, will you be ready? Because you had built yourself with the most holy faith. Faith is holy. Faith is towards God. Today you hear a gospel where faith is towards possessions, not towards God. That is unholy. You cannot have a faith towards mammon. It's a faith towards God. And they become big preachers. with Large crowds, drawing crowds. God is not talking about faith towards mammon. He's talking about faith towards God. And when it's faith is towards God, it is holy. Have you built yourself with your most holy faith? Will you be able to survive tribulation? Oh no, but I'm going to be raptured. Who said? What if you are captured instead of raptured? Will you survive? Did you build yourself in the most holy faith? Are we making use of our time now? Next one. Second Timothy one six.
Therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. Principle. The principle behind you. Are you faithful to the gift that God has given you? There's nobody here who has not been gifted with something. God is not a respecter of person. Everybody has been gifted with something. Are you faithful with your gift? Are you faithful with your gift? The beautiful thing about God's gifts is that the more you use it, the better it becomes. The more you exercise it, the more it grows. In God's kingdom, whatever He gives, there is no loss with giving. It only increases. In the world, it is not that way. That's exactly why the kingdom of God is opposite to the kingdom of the world. In the kingdom of God, in the kingdom of the world, if I have 100 rupees and I give 10, it becomes only 90. But in the kingdom of God, if I have 100 and I give 10 out, it doesn't become 90, it becomes 110. Meaning with that 90, I can do now more than I could do with 100 because I gave it to God. It increases. With every gift God has given, your anointing only increases with use. The world will say, more you use, wear and tear. God says, no. You can wear and it will never tear. He said, really Lord? He says, go check the book of Deuteronomy, how my children walked in the desert because I led them. Their clothes did not wear off. Their sandals did not wear off. Why, why Lord? Because it was anointed. I send them out. I clothe them. And I send them out. It grew on them. It did not wear off. God says, my gifts don't wear off. They become better with use. It should become better with use. God says, are you exercising your gifts? Second Peter. Sorry, first Peter. Chapter 4 and verse 10. As each one has received a, each one has received a gift. Minister it to, uh, first understand this, your gift has been given, not for you, not for your puppy, it is for one another. This is where you need to understand this concept about a body. This hand belongs to this body. Whatever this hand does, does it for the rest of the body. I use this hand for this hand too, but I use this hand for the rest of the body to minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. God will ask us one day, were you faithful? But I didn't know what your gift was, Lord. He said, why didn't you ask? I would have told you what your gift was. Did you ever get into the closet and ask me, Lord, what is my gift? Why didn't you ask me? Do you remember about the man who hid his gift and did not use it? And says, okay, you gave it, here, take it back. Do you know what the response was? The response was, you never believed in me. Your salvation was never genuine. Why, if your salvation was genuine, you you would have used your gift. Therefore, throw him into the outer darkness. Suddenly, the gift is connected with salvation. Like we keep saying, God doesn't create junk. Everybody has a purpose in the kingdom. God says, did you use your gift? Were you faithful with your gift? Are we faithful? Because with every gift comes responsibility. Every gift comes responsibility. First Timothy chapter 1 verse 12. And I thank God, Christ Jesus our Lord, who has enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Suddenly you see a different thing over there. When God sees Richie being faithful with the little gift he has. Right now probably he has no gifts. But what does he do? He knows there is one thing he can do like anybody can do that he can get into his closet, start interceding for others. And when God says, hey, 
you are faithful with your gift and I am going to be putting you into the ministry because I counted you faithful. That's how ministry should begin. Otherwise you are self-appointed minister. God-appointed ministers are those who were found faithful and then put into the ministry. And it must be a simple gift. It might have just begun by cleaning the church. But you were not cleaning it for the pastor. The pastor didn't even know, but God knew. And God says, you know what? He's good. I can walk on that floor. He's good. He does a good job. And he knows in the situation in Hyderabad how to clean the floor with minimum water. Not forgetting there are people living downstairs who may not have water and you splurge the water for the floor when I care for the souls who live down. He knows how to make use of the limited resources and yet do a good job. Both are important for God. Remember he loves souls, whether they believe in him or not. Even if you and I don't see, he sees the people standing in the queue for water with the utensils. When we throw water away, he sees them. We may ignore them. He sees them. He says, you're a good steward and you are faithful. You know what? I'm going to put you into the ministry. That's how all genuine ministries have been born because God found people faithful with the little things he had committed into their hands. It has to be always that God, Christ Jesus our Lord has to put me into the ministry for me to endure and to continue. But he doesn't put people who haven't been found faithful with the little gifts that is given. And Paul is saying, Timothy, what happened to you? You received a gift, right? What are you doing with that gift? He went back and you're good, you're a good steward of the wrapping. We don't throw wrappers out in India, right? We take it out carefully and put it under our pillow to use it next time. That's a good stewardship. Why waste money on wrappers? But Timothy, I thought, You are using the wrapper for another gift. Instead, you have wrapped your old gift back in the wrapper. What are you doing with your gift? What are you doing with your gift? You know, Timothy, the gift was given for the others. By you not using your gift, you are defrauding the rest of the body. Ah, That is the problem. You are defrauding the rest of the body. Think, if Sister Mary suddenly decides, I'm not going to cook today. How many children will go hungry? How many will go hungry? 27 children plus all the others who end up there. (laughs) All those who laughed are those who end up there, okay? You know now, (laughs) the culprit. Can you imagine? So, by not using a gift... Because it is spiritual and not visible, God says a lot of people in the house of God are going hungry spiritually because that need is not met. They are crying out to me. I said I gave it there. So on that day, I will call you accountable and say, you know what, this brother, this sister, this one struggled so much because you hid the gift. And the gift was given for ministering to one another. It was not given for you. It's not a birthday gift. Don't confuse with the gift with a birthday gift. When somebody gives me a birthday gift, it is for me. This is not a birthday gift. This was not the Holy Spirit gave it to you when on your birthday. This is a gift given for the use within the body. And when you don't use it, God says you're defrauding somebody. And you're not faithful. You're not faithful. And God is asking us, are we faithful? Like I told, if your gift is singing, are you singing? The more you sing, the better you become. The more you learn about music, the more you go and check out worship songs, the more you look into what the lyrics are, the more you seek God for more anointing upon the words that come out of your mouth. This is not a talent show. This is an anointing show. This is where the anointing has to flow. For the anointing to flow, you have to ask Lord, more fire in this gift. More fire in this gift. More fire in the gift. You gave me a gift. 
That's what he's talking about in Timothy 1.6, right? Second. 1.6. What does he say there? Therefore, I remind you to stir up. What is that? What will another version say? Fan back to flames. It's an anointing. There's an anointing with the gift. And the anointing increases upon the gift. Are you using it? The anointing increasing? If prayer is a gift given to you, are your prayers becoming more and more and more powerful? Are you hearing clearer and clearer from God what to pray for? Whatever your gift is, whatever your gift is, I don't know what your gift is. Whatever your gift is. Everybody, scripture says, has a gift. And the gift is given for others. This is not your birthday gift. This is given by the Lord of heaven to minister to others. And he says, are you faithful with your gift? How faithful are you? Like they say in the world, genius is 90% Perspiration. 10% inspiration. Every genius, even in God's kingdom, there is a lot of hard work that is involved. Yes, God will do it. Yes, God will do it through me if I am ready and disciplined and will slog for it. That's why Paul says, I work harder than any one of you. And Jesus says, my father and I have been from work from the beginning till today. We don't even take a break. And God says, do we? Are we faithful with what God has given? Why it is so important is when you are faithful with that, God says, I will commit you into something really bigger. I want to put you into the ministry. I want to put you into the ministry. Ask our young people. Any one of our young people who were in bands earlier. When they were in bands, they were banned from the church. Now they are disbanded, they are back in the church. But ask them whenever they had their shows, how much practice went into it. (laughs) Do you know how much practice they put into it? The actual bands in the world, do you know this? they, They take drugs to remain awake for hours and hours without sleep. They go drugged for what? For a show. For a show. This is show? This is not a show. This is not a show. There's no show in God's house. God says, how much have you put in? How come you are so busy always coming to withdraw from my bank without any deposit? Didn't I say that you could put treasures in heaven? But the deposits are made from earth. Withdrawal is from heaven, I agreed. But deposits are put in heaven, from earth. How come you come and cry out to me and I look and see you have put no deposit at all? Your bank balance is zero. That's why your checks are bouncing when you pray. God says, are we faithful? Are we found faithful in our ministry? Are we found faithful? First Peter, the next one. First Peter chapter 4 verses 12 to 16. The most difficult one. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice in as much as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings that when his glory shall be revealed you may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part his evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief or as an evildoer or as a busybody in other men's matters. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him 
glorify God on this behalf. God is saying, are you faithful during your trials? Are you faithful? Are we faithful during our trials? Or the minute difficulty starts coming up because we chose to follow God, we back out. Oh, I didn't realize this was what it was going to be. Little difficulty. A little difficulty. That's all it takes. Does it become a persecution for you? Does it, do you remain faithful? Revelation chapter 2 verse 10. Look at what Jesus tells this church. Fear none of these things. First let's read from 9. I know your works and tribulation and poverty. Okay? You are poor. You have nothing. This is not a Laodicean church which will only boast about how much they got after God and people. Okay? It's a poor church. But God says, you know what? You are really rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. He says, it's not over for you, child. You're going to suffer more. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison. That you may be tried. Yes, you shall have tribulation ten days, a period, symbolic period, another ten years, twenty years, we don't know. It's going to continue, he says. But you be faithful unto death. Be faithful in your tribulation, in your trials. Will you be? Do you have any clue what God's people have gone through or going through right now and remaining faithful? Let me tell you about a sister, a white sister in Africa, in a particular community. There are these mission hospitals where she works. She's been established. And there are these two tribes. They can't stand each other. Even they are in the church. You know, it happens. That's when the facade of Christianity breaks apart and Hutus and Tutsis kill each other. Till yesterday they were standing side by side and worshipping and then suddenly racial prejudice comes in and they chop each other's head off. It's not that place, another place. I'm not mentioning the place or the name. This is the sister who is ministered among them for years and years and years. These two tribes never come together. It's not possible to bridge that gap. Because racial prejudice, tribal affinities are so strong. And then one day, <coughs> there is a revolt and one of the tribes have come in. They come in, they don't know this village, they don't know the people over there, they come in, they kill a few people, they take over the hospital and they rape the sister. Through it all, she cried out to the Lord and said, Lord, give me the grace. She cried. The next day, she's brought out and the two groups are there from the village. The two tribes are there and she's in the middle and they are planning to kill her. The group that has come in and they said, one of you take her head off. You know what happened? At that point, God broke the racial prejudice. The whole tribe got around and said, over her dead bodies, you kill her. Her response to God was that if it took the violation of my body for your grace to enter into his heart, it is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. We are talking about real situations happening now. I have no clue why the body of God is suffering for his name's sake. That's what Paul says. In me, let your sufferings be completed. My body is for you. God says, what is the persecution you are going through because of my name's sake? Do you rejoice? Are you glad? Don't you know when you are persecuted for my name's sake and you rejoice, my glory is upon you? That's when my glory rests upon you. Are you faithful in your trials? Are you faithful in your tribulations? 
My one daily reading, I always read Easter daily readings that comes from, not our churches, from the underground churches around the world of people who have given up everything to hold on to the name of Christ. That keeps me going. Maybe to some I send you. Whether it is children, whether it is older people, those who won't buckle under tribulation and will rejoice and say, Lord, we count it worthy to suffer for your name's sake. It's not like the gospel you are hearing. It's a different gospel that is real and powerful. And God says, are you faithful to this church? He says, you be faithful, okay? I'm not going to get you out of trouble. I know you're in a lot of trouble. But I'm not going to get you in trouble because the more trouble I see, you're still faithful. I'm asking you, you going to continue for a season. Remain faithful until death. And what will I give you? I will give you a crown of life. What is a crown? What does a crown mean? Crown means the pinnacle of your glory. When a prince is crowned, he reaches the height. He becomes a king. God is saying, the life, my life, I told you to choose me. If you rejoice in your tribulation with all, and remain faithful till the end, my life will reach the crowning point in your life. That's when you will really know me as I am. And you will be able to rejoice in your tribulation only when you have made these choices for life. Lord, it is you I want, it is you I want, it is you I want, it is you I want. That's when you remain faithful to him in tribulation. If you are choosing things, then you will remain faithful to things. If you choose him, you will remain faithful to him. Revelation 13 and verse 10. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. He says, don't get disturbed by all the things that is happening. Be patient and be faithful. Be patient and be faithful. This applies both ways. In the church, Some may be killed by the sword. Some may be turned into captivity. He says, you remain patient and remain faithful till the end. Let that not turn your heart away from me. Don't believe God. I will worship you only if it happens this way. Otherwise I will not. Otherwise I will not. Get it right, the word right. Because I'm telling you, the people who are swallowing the gospel of prosperity will not stand tribulation. They will not be able, because their souls are lean. They will not be able to handle tribulation. They will buckle and they will run and they will deny him. Because their souls were not forged in fire. When you want to make steel out of iron, you put it into fire. You put it into fire and you hammer it so that it can be used. That's what God does. He says, I will refine you seven times over so that I can use you. All God's servants come through fire. He brings them through fire so that he can use them more powerfully. He doesn't give them ease. Yet he says in one place, Ephraim or whatever, he says, you have rested in your lease. You're good for nothing in my kingdom. God is saying, are you faithful? Are we faithful? Revelation 14, 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. This is, they were patient. They were faithful. In the midst of their suffering and their troubles. They didn't buckle. They remained faithful. It's a series of choices we make now. It won't happen when the day of evil comes. Ephesians 6 will say, when the day of evil comes, stand. But you won't stand that day if you had made your choices before it. Joseph's decision to run away from Potiphar's wife wasn't made that day. That was made many, many years ago.
Daniel's decision not to shut the window, but to leave the window and pray was not made the day the edit was given. It was a lifetime choice. So when the test came, the character is firm. And you won't buckle because a habit has become a character. It has become a character now. It's part of you. It cannot change. And you know, because of the choices you have made, it's so firm in you. Any edict of any king in the world will come, but you do not change the edict of the king in heaven. You go by that. Because you have made your choices. Daniel 6.4 a man who made his choices. And the presidents and the princes sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could not find no occasion, no fault, for as much as he was... What? What was he? His faith. They couldn't find anything. How do you trap this fellow? He's so faithful. Then he realized, okay, there is a conflict here. His boss puts him on a job. He's faithful and honest to do it. And he's also equally faithful in his prayer life. Let's bring a conflict between these two. Let him, let us ask him to choose between his two bosses and put him into trouble. So the king says, they trap the king by saying, for 30 days, nobody shall pray. And he chooses to be faithful to his real boss. Are we getting the picture? Moses was found faithful in the whole house. Moses was not a perfect man. Please understand that he was not a per- he had so many issues in his life, but he was found faithful. God is not talking about perfection here. He's talking about faithfulness here. Imperfect people also can end faithful. You know what Solomon said about somebody? Who turned his back on God and lived 16 months in the Philistine camp. Who took another man's wife. Killed her husband. Who messed up big time. You know what God says about him? In 1 Kings chapter 3 verse 6. And Solomon said, Thou hast shown unto thy servant David my father great mercy, according as he walked before thee in truth, and in righteousness, and in uprightness of heart with thee, thou hast kept for him this great kindness, that thou hast given him a son to sit on his throne, as it is this day. He said, My father was faithful. That's how David ends. David ends faithful. God considers him faithful. God doesn't consider him perfect. What he says, at that day, I'm not looking at perfection. I'm looking at how many finished faithfully. Are you faithful? Will you be faithful? Will you be counted faithful? Then if you are found faithful, then you will be considered good. Then if you are good and faithful, he will say, enter into my Joy. Take authority. Rule over these cities. But he says, if you were not faithful, even though you were perfect, you were not faithful, how can I give you authority? Because what is said about Lucifer? You were found perfect in all your ways. But you are not faithful. Yes, God says be perfect. As He is perfect. But remember about His perfection. Psalm 100, Psalm 100 verse 5. Hundred. Yeah. Hundred verse 5. For God is faithful. Another version will say, our God is faithful, His mercy is everlasting, and His truth endures to all generations. Let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 13. 
something about God. If we believe not, if we believe not, yet he is, what is he? He is faithful. Even if I don't believe, he is still, thank God, right? What if God looks at him and says, oh, Peter doesn't believe me anymore. Enough. I am giving up all I believe in. But then the rest are gone. But God says, even if you don't believe, I am still faithful. He's still faithful. Have you seen the picture of Jesus coming to reign earth in Revelation 19? When he comes back to rule with his saints. Wow, he comes crowned with many crowns, riding a white horse. He comes. Look at him. Verse 11. Now I saw heaven opened. And behold a white horse, and he who sat on him was called. What is he called? He's called faithful. What is he looking for? Faithful servants. Why? Because he's called faithful and true. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. Are you getting the picture, church? God is asking us, are we faithful? Are we faithful with our families? Are we faithful with our finances? Are we faithful with our fellowship? Are we faithful with our faith? Are we faithful with our gift? Are we faithful with our ministry? Are we faithful in trials? There are many others. Romans 12, 12. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, faithful in, continuing steadfastly means faithful. Faithful in what? Yes, brother, I'll pray for you. Before the phone is over, forgotten what the... God says, wow, faithful in prayer. How faithful are we in prayer? God says, are you faithful? In prayer. Steadfast, faithful in prayer. As a close, let me tell you this. It is not required to be intelligent, educated, clever or famous in the kingdom of God. It is only required to be faithful. And most of the people in the kingdom of God who were faithful were neither intelligent, they were not good looking, they were not very educated, they were not very smart. Most of them were never famous, but they were faithful. They were faithful. Whatever they did, they were faithful. And always begins with little things. That's why little things matter. We don't realize little things matter. Little things matter. And Jesus was found faithful over the entire house of God. And we are the house. And He wants the house to be faithful like Him. And today God is asking us, go back and start with the basics. Start with home. Start with money. Start with fellowship. Start with your word. Start with your prayer. Start with your gift. If you allowed a gift, you don't know what your gift is, go back into the closet and say, Lord, show me what did you gift me with. For all you know, you may be called to pray. And prayers change nations. Prayer doesn't create an impression on anybody other than God. But if God is what you are seeking, you are willing to make that impression. The most neglected gift in the church is prayer. Most neglected. More people in this hour are called to pray than any other hour. More people. Very few are called to preach. More people are called to pray. Because the body of Christ on earth is facing tribulation like never before around the world. There is no defense. There is no defense. There was a time when the nations of the world, the western nations of the world, stood up for the church. Now, they are against the church. So the church finally is with no defense but God and the people who pray. 
They have no defense anywhere. They have no defense anywhere. And you need to realize there has never been a time in our history, human history, where the church has been called to stand in the gap. When we are free, we don't have troubles. We don't have persecutions. We don't have tribulations. We do, if, if your husband is angry with you, don't call it tribulation. Okay? Please don't. Let us fight at home. And if you don't have a job, I'm sure you ate three meals yesterday. Don't cry. You'll get your job. No, this is not trials and tribulations. None of this are trials and tribulations. People are losing their heads every day for Christ. Yet they are not fearful, but they are faithful. This is the hour God has called the church to be faithful, young and old. Be faithful. Be faithful. Get into the prayer closet and pray. As I close, there was an interesting anecdote that I read. Moses was interceding for Israel while Joshua was fighting the enemy down. And he was getting tired. And you know what? It says, her was not afraid of body order. So lifted him up and stood near his armpit. Somebody actually said, this man must have been stinking, sweating, struggling. But there was somebody there who lifted his hand up. Therefore, Israel won. What is all you are called to do is in the closet and lift the hands of Moses around the world while Joshua is fighting. Think about this. What do you remember about her? That's all. Can you remember anything else about her? But because one man chose to put a rock under him and hold his hand up, a nation won. And what if that is all you are called to be and God says, it will be written on that day when my church in this country was under attack, this child in Hyderabad went to the closet and lifted the hand of the pastor up and the church came out victorious. And it will be never taken away. That's your record. That's your record. But you have to see this all in faith. Through the eyes of God. You have to see it. And you will find it only in the closet. That's why God said, choose me. Choose life. Choose me. Choose life. Get into that closet. Seek my face and I will tell you great and mighty things what is happening. I will tell you. I will speak to you what is happening within the body. I will tell you. What is happening? Shall we stand? My prayer is this, God. When all our churches are facing so much tribulation, help this church to become the powerhouse. To get on our knees and pray. Just intercede for the worldwide church. Every church, every church of ours, every church, It doesn't matter which part of the globe it is. Every church, let me repeat it again, every church of ours is going through tribulation. Every church. Whether it is in Asia, whether it's in Europe, whether it's in Africa, whether it's in US, whether it's in South America, it doesn't matter where it is. Every church is going through tribulation because of the salvation that is taking place. And powers of darkness are furious. When drug addicts come out of their addiction and get into the house of God, when prostitutes get saved in their thousands and come off the streets, when people in authority come out, when corruption ceases, there are lots of powers that are being shaken. They come after the church. The church has been given one weapon. God says, pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. He says, when you pray, angels are empowered to fight on behalf of God's people. Pray, 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 pray. 
That's what actually happens. They are released. And ten praying people will make a praying church. If Abraham could stand between God and the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, Moses could stand before God and the destruction of Israel. One man, just one man, one woman, one child. God says, I was amazed. I looked for one man who would intercede. And I was amazed because I found none. Let him not be amazed about us. Let him say, I found many who in their secrets got out in their closets, shut the door behind them. And they cried out to me for their brethren. They cried out. And I could reveal to them where their brethren were suffering. Where their brethren were broken. I could reveal it to them. Because the word says, it's the spirit of God who searches out. And he will pray through us with groanings that cannot be uttered. That's the cry of God through the human body. Back to God. The souls of the righteous are crying out under the altar. How long, Lord, how long? The Almighty God is still saying, a little while, a little while. There are others who will join your ranks. When it is complete, it will be over. Church, when each one of us stand before Him that day, will He be counted? Will we be counted faithful? Father, this morning, even as you examine our hearts, we examine our hearts too. And we acknowledge, O God, of so many that we heard today, we were not faithful to many or all. We fell short because we were not found faithful. Yet we were not even really tested. Then when the real test comes, O God, where will we stand? Father, I pray you will give us the wisdom and the boldness and the strength to make right choices from now. Now. To change the course in which we are going. The direction that we are going. Because that's what we've been hearing from you for weeks. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and seek my face, pray and turn from their wicked ways. Every way other than your way is wicked. And our ways are wicked. Because we have not sought you in all things. If we turn from our wicked ways, you said you will heal. Change our ways, O God. And help us to change. If you want to make choices, the choices of life. Choices, even little, mundane choices, where we choose you. For you are life. There is no life outside of you. That we choose you. Help us to make that choice every day. Continue to pray for the churches. Oh, Father, stretch forth your hand. Stretch forth your hand, Lord. Stretch forth your hand of power over your church, around the world, over your pastors, their families, the children, the women, the children. Oh, Father, stretch forth your hand over them. Cover them, cover them. Keep them boldness. Oh, Father, keep them boldness. We speak confusion into the ranks of the enemy. They will look, but they will not see. 
they will search, they will not find, they will listen, they will not hear. Oh Father, let confusion reign in the camp of the enemy. Those who come against your children. With swords and knives, with guns and bombs, that there be confusion. Yet even among that crowd, let there be tomorrow's souls hidden. From among them, let come mighty men of God, mighty women of God, who will see the strength and the confidence and the love of your children and fall at your feet and beg for mercy. For oh, this is the power of the gospel. And Lord, we are not ashamed of the gospel. We are not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God unto salvation. We are not ashamed. Send forth your word. And heal your people. Blinded. Heal the people. Let there be healing in your house today. Touch each one. Those who are struggling, those who are straying, those with divided hearts, divided minds. Oh Father, let them fan back to flames the gift that you have deposited in their spirit. However young, however old, in the kingdom nobody takes their slippers off and sits in the rocking chair. Because you are called to be like Caleb. Give me that mountain. For I am as strong today as the day that Moses sent me out. Give me my mountain. Mighty men, mighty women, mighty children. Serving a mighty God. Release your power. Into our souls, into our spirits. Release your power.